Susie, you're very welcome to the Scalex Insider podcast. I'm really delighted and thrilled to have you on the show today. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Brendan. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, and I was just saying earlier off her, you're an absolute ambassador. For those who are listening and not watching on YouTube, uh, you are glowing, a real ambassador for your product. So I love that. Thank uh, you. Thank you. We have been sharing off air. Our vision is to inspire, connect and enable millions of ambitious leaders of small and medium sized enterprises to scale with purpose. So I open up the show with this question to all of our guests. What does scaling with purpose mean to you, Susie? Oh, that's a great question. Scaling with purpose. I mean, it's, I suppose it's, it's exactly what the question is. It's making sure that when you grow, you grow not just to grow to make more money and to be bigger or to be the best. You know, sometimes I hear that people say, I want to grow because I want to be the best. I want to be, I want to be the biggest. Um, it's actually having a real meaningful purpose behind the reason for your company growing. So is it that you're going to impact positively on more people's lives? Is it that you're going to do something with the with the money that you make from the company to, to transform, I don't know, education, climate change, something. So having a real meaningful purpose that sings to people's hearts within your company, not just to not just to make money. Yeah, I love that. And I know it's something you speak a lot about. And we'll get into that today, the, the wonderful concept of having an infinite purpose. But I mean, your your story is incredible. And it would be it would be enriching for the, the listeners to get a sense of your story before we get into the podcast. Can you can you share with our listeners your journey from Shanghai to Australia to London and eventually creating what is now the UK's fastest growing skincare brand? Yeah, sure. So I was born in Shanghai. Um, I was born into, I suppose if you were to compare it to today's standards, like relative poverty in Shanghai, we my family and I, we didn't have a huge amount of money and my mother and I lived in this little shed at the back of this ground floor flat with like no heating. Um, we, we were fine with food. We just didn't have a lot of just basic things that actually when I was a kid, it was fine because I had the love for my mom, for my grandparents who raised me. But later on in life, you look back and you think, oh my gosh, we, we were freezing cold in the winter and we would go to bed with all of our clothes. You know, the, the walls were covered in mold and my mom used to put all these, um, all these calendar, like old calendars from previous years that people were throwing away and, and cut them out and stick them all over the walls as wallpaper. And, and every night when we used to go to bed, I used to look up at these calendars and my mom always tried to pick like the most beautiful calendars of pictures of beautiful places around the world and pictures of beautiful homes and beautiful furniture. And I used to go to bed looking up at the ceilings and the walls of these incredible photos around the world of like Venice and Italy and mansions. Wow. And just thinking, gosh, maybe one day, may maybe like this, the world looks like that. Like it looks totally different in, in this little shed that my mom and I are sleeping in. Like literally the bed was the entire room. Um, and so that was kind of in the back of my mind that the whole time when I was a little girl, when I was, um, when I was one years old, my dad went to Australia to, he saved up, like the whole family saved up money to, to send my dad for a one way plane to get to Australia. And when he went over there, he, he started working as a street vendor, doing any odd jobs to kind of make ends meet. Um, and when I was six years old, so five years later, my mother and I joined my father in Australia. So he'd save up some money for some plane tickets for us to go over as well. And in Oz, we, we started off in Sydney. My parents were street vendors and, and I used to work with them selling knickknacks on the streets. Um, and then after about a year or two, we all moved up to Cairns in Northern Queensland yeah. in North Australia. And that was when actually business flourished for my parents. They sold little toys and souvenirs and they did really well actually um, at that time. And suddenly we were able to afford a house to live in um, and your money goes further up north as well, because back then it wasn't very populated. Um, and we were able to afford to send my grandparents over to um, Australia to live with us. And it was then that I really discovered a love for like natural skincare. Um, my grandmother on my mum's side, she was a toxicologist and a surgeon in her youth. And she's incredible. So she really taught me from an early age the importance of eating foods that are as close to nature as possible, but also apply ingredients onto your skin that are as close to nature as possible. 
and we were really we just loved where we lived because it was there was so many natural beauty around us and the, like the rainforest to the beaches but more than that there was so much that was growing around us you know we were in the tropics with an abundance of sunshine and moisture everything grows and everything is lush you know we had aloe vera in our back garden which was just growing like weed we had mango trees and when you go to the markets, people are selling things like macadamia oil, jojoba oil, all different types of essential oils, all local produce. And my grandmother and I, we used to buy all these different ingredients, some from our garden, and just make skincare products from soaps to body scrubs um, to moisturizers. And the, my favorite product that my grandmother used to make was this body scrub um, that was made from sea salts and some natural oils, jojoba and macadamia. And then she put in this essential oil called lemon myrtle, um, which essentially helped to ward off mosquitoes. And I used to be bitten all the time. So me you too. Would this body scrub. Yeah, mosquitoes love you. Got- <laughs> love me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you apply this body scrub, you rub it onto your skin and you rinse off the salt and your skin feels super soft in the oils. And then the lemon myrtle um, wards off the mosquitoes. So I, so I did that a lot, which, which, which you know, I absolutely love. One of my favorite memories with my grandma. Um, and then fast forward a few years living in Oz, uh, my parents' marriage broke down. My dad was actually, he ended up being um, quite a violent and not a very nice man in the end. And my mother and I decided that we needed to leave and get away. Um, we actually had a friend in the UK and we thought, let's let's try London. It was the furthest away we could go from Australia. Wow. And, we, and we gave it a shot. Um, I was 13 years old at the time. And I remember moving over to London with a one-way plane ticket. My mum had hardly any money with her. And we had all of our stuff that was on a ship coming from Australia to London a couple of months after we'd arrived. And just arriving in London at Heathrow Airport with just this one singular friend that had said that we could stay with them. And when we arrived, my mum called her. Her name was Della. Uh, Sorry, her name was Maureen. Um... And Maureen said that we can't stay with her. She said to my mum that she never expected her to come all the way from Australia to London with a 13 year old daughter with no job lined up. And Maureen said that if she allowed us to stay with her, then we may never leave. So my goodness. we couldn't even host us for one single night. Oh my goodness. And my mum and I were at Heathrow Airport just completely confused as to where we were going to go and what we were going to do. And I remember my mum saying, well, I believe in my mum's quite superstitious. And she said, she's always very positive. And she said, well, um, let's, let's look at what we can, like, you know, we, we need to go somewhere. We need to live somewhere and work somewhere. And I'm going to channel... My favorite color, which was green at the time, and she's that's because my her father's surname was green, and she said, "Okay, my dad's surname is green. It's always been my lucky color. It's always been, you know, the word that is is my lucky word. So let's live and work somewhere with green in it." And I was like, "Mom, that is so crazy! Like, what are you talking about?" And we went up to this lady in Heathrow, and, and my mum said, "Okay, we need to stay somewhere." Um, and she said, oh, you can do homestay um, rather than hotels because it's much cheaper. And my mom, and she said, where do you want to stay? And my mum said, somewhere with, with the word green in it. And the woman was like, well, there's a place called Hither Green. And I was like, that's it. We'll stay in Hither Green. <laughs> and, then we, and, then, and, then, and, and then my mum said, um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a market store trader. I, I worked in markets in Australia and I've got some I've got some products to sell, some toys to sell. It, is there somewhere where I can sell my products with the word green in it? And this woman said, well, there's there's Greenwich Market. <laughs> and my mom said, great, we'll live in the green and we'll work in Greenwich Market. <laughs> but that's exactly what happened. We, we moved to the Green um, at this homestay with a lady called Della. And my mum worked at Greenwich Market selling her, her, her produce, her toys and her little wooden, um, w- wooden toys. And we did that for a few months. And 
very quickly we realized that it wasn't really going to get us anywhere. Um, it just wasn't making much money. And anyway, to cut a long story short, we stayed in the homestay for a few months. And then my mother and I moved, we moved out into our own little flat. And we kind of, we kind of really tried to survive. You know, we were the family that went at the end of each day at the supermarket into the into like the almost expired area to just buy whatever that was left. It was always like Tesco's own brand, like 10 P loaves of bread. Everything was as cheap as possible. Um, we just didn't buy anything because we couldn't afford anything. My dad finally paid for my education. Um, but apart from that, there was, there was nothing else that we could pay for. And after two years of living like that, I just, I just felt like it just wasn't the life for us. You know, I remember going to school and speaking to my friends and hearing that they were, they were having birthday parties and they were getting presents and they were getting, you know, they were able to buy presents for their parents because they were getting pocket money and just feeling so like ashamed that I was never able to buy a birthday present for my friends, that I was never able to buy a new outfit to go out um, to the cinema or, you know, just, just little, little things that as a kid you want. And I remember saying to my mom one day, and she was, she was sitting in the living room crying, looking at all these letters of just, you know, you're late with this bill, you're late with that bill, or this electricity is going to be cut off. And we was just, she was so upset. And I remember saying to her, like, mom, we, like, I'm going to help you. We need to, we need to expand, like, our ideas of what we deserve. And we don't deserve this life. We deserve so much more. And I remember thinking, you know, what can I do to help my mom earn some money? The only thing that I knew was my mom working at the markets and maybe I could sell something with her at the markets. And the only product that I really loved and that I knew how to make was this body scrub that my grandmother used to make with me in Australia. And so I asked my mum to lend me 200 pounds out of the very little that she had left. It was probably some of her last money. And I, I gave her a full sales pitch and like, you know, a full business pitch and I managed to convince her. And with that 200 pounds, I bought 50 jam jars. I bought the ingredients needed to fill those jam jars with my grandma's body scrub recipe. With a bit of a tweak, I added some more essential oils. I went to my GP and took some tongue depressors to use as platelets for the body scrub. I, um, I went to my school and just borrowed a couple of sports water bottles to do demonstrations with. Um, and I took a couple of mixing bowls from home. And over one summer, so this was the 20th of June, plus this will be 2004, I went to Greenwich Market with my mum over the summer school holidays and kind of laid out all of my jam jars. And I started inviting people in for a demonstration because I knew that they had to try the product to love it and to want to buy it. And I, and one by one, I'd say, hey, would you like to try my handmade body scrub on your hands for a free hand treatment? They come over, they place their hands over the mixing bowls. I get out my tongue depressor, scoop a bit of the scrub onto their hands. They rub their hands together front and back. And then I get my sports water bottle filled with warm water, rinse their hands, so rinsing off all the salts. And then I give them some paper towels to dry their hands. And I tell them about the product, that it was freshly made with love, with 100% natural ingredients inspired by the tropics in Australia. And one by one, they, they loved it. And you know, the, the product itself looked awful. I, it was in a jam jar and I had labels that I had designed in Microsoft Word and Microsoft Paint and stuck on with print stick, printed off at school. It didn't look great, but the product itself was wonderful. And I sold the product at 20 pounds RRP. Wow. Um, and I sold out. And you know, at the end, of, when I set off that day, I said to my mom, I'm gonna make 80 pounds to help pay off that water bill. Mm. So so late in payment but actually at the end of that very first day i sold all of my jam jars so i had 50 i took one as a tester said 49 to sell at 20 pounds each i made 980 pounds my first day selling oh susie there is oh. there's there's <laughs> so much in this uh so what age were you and what year was this again 
I was 15 when I first started, and that was uh, 2004, I believe. And the, the seeds, the origin of Tropic Skin Care began. Yeah, that was it. And, and, you know, I remember coming home that day thinking, oh my gosh, like, ha, ha, like I'd never seen that much money in my life. Mm. That was life changing. Mm. And, you know, for a lot of people that I speak to who talk about starting up a business for the first time, they talk about getting seed money and yeah. investors and all this stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> guys, you can start a business with nothing. 200 pounds is all I had when I first started. And with that, I grew organically and invested. In that. And, you know, there are markets across London where to trade for a day is like 50 quid. And you pay that, you test the market, you see if those customers are responding to your product. And there are, like, if you really think, you know, we had a lack of resources back then. And when you have a lack of resource, you're really scrappy and you think about how you can make things work with very little money and you're more creative. You know, rather than getting an expensive, beautiful wooden spoon, I got just got my GP to give me some tongue depressors, and and it sounds it sounds really you know it doesn't sound like it was you know an amazing product in the beginning because of the way it looks, but as long as the internal product is amazing, customers will come back and keep on buying, and that's what happened. There, there is so much in that. Something that stands out to me, well starts off with your your mum's what we now call a vision board your mum's vision board in that little shed in shanghai yeah. you know yeah. s sowing the seeds as you went to bed every night yeah. uh, visualizing an another another country and another life I, I i love that the what i what i'd like to tease out from that before we get into the you know the some of the some of the, the the challenges and opportunities which you have taken to build what is now an incredible brand you have hundreds of people employed you know nine figures revenue uh you know just just incredible the there's a saying in this part of the world must do as a great master and when you have to do something when your back's against the wall that tends to be when you are most creative when you use you know your your you have the most motivation um you don't you know the the desire to do something is coming intrinsically because you have to and what i'm curious to understand Lack of ambition of the leader is cited as the single greatest impediment as to why SMEs don't scale. And I was sharing with you before the significance of this because there are 5.7 million SMEs in the UK alone. They contribute £2 trillion worth of revenue to the UK economy. And half of that is coming from 34,000 companies like you, Susie, who have successfully scaled. But, you know, you... You know, given the success of the company, you could sell all up and go and retire in one of those lovely tropical locations that you have beautifully described. How do you continue to build that almost trauma into the business so that you continue to be motivated to to scale this business? You know, clearly in the early days, and you're you know that's not to, that's not overlooking your. You're an incredibly intelligent and capable young lady, but there's a lot of trauma that was baked into your story, which at each juncture you have, you know, decided that we're going to choose not to lie down. We're going to, to, to take our own initiative, to take things in our control and take the next minimum viable action. How do you do that now, given the success of the business to ensure that actually that that motivation is there to continue to scale yeah and and that's a really important question brendan you know having that motivation and the more motivated you are at the top of the business the more motivated everyone yeah. else yeah. and you know because it trickles down the passion and everything trickles down so it's fundamentally important that you are motivated and and it all starts with finding your why you know why do you do what you do in the beginning, I had my vision board, which was, I actually drew a picture of the house that I wanted to buy for my mum and stuck it to the back of our front door. So we would look at it every single day before I left for work or went to school. And it was that picture 
that was, you know, I've probably, my mum, I don't think my mum meant to have this vision board in our bedroom. I think she just wanted beautiful photos of places <laughs> around the world, but, but it did end up being that vision board. So it's asking, you know, what is your vision board? Like, what is your why for your future? Because you're right, I could go and retire on a private island right now and, and, and like live an amazing life and sell my business. But what then? Like, what fulfills you? And and for me, your why isn't, um, it's not like a tangible thing, like my why is to make loads of money or my why is to travel all over the world. Your why needs to be linked to a feeling. How do you want to feel as a person when you're older, like when you're on your deathbed, like how do you want to feel when you look back at your life? Do you want to feel pride? Do you want to feel fulfillment? Do you want to feel like you have lived life to the full and made the most out of your abilities to help improve the life of others? How do you want to feel? Because if at the end of your life, you just lay there with loads of money, like so much money, so much property and wealth, but you don't feel a sense of joy from the community that you've spent a lot of time with around you, you don't feel a sense of fulfillment from enough laughter um, you know, in your life. You don't feel enough, I don't know, like just like you haven't seen enough of the world. Then, then that's not a life lived to its fullest, in my opinion. Yeah. So it's figuring out your why. You know, for me, I want to feel all those things. I want to feel totally fulfilled. I want to feel like I have done my best on this planet to make the world a better place. You know, we have 20,000 ambassadors across the country right now. They're predominantly women and they're predominantly mothers. And I see them as my mom. I want to help them improve their lives because ultimately that's what gives me joy and makes me happy. And when I spend time with our community of ambassadors, whether it's going well on holiday with them or celebrating them on stage or at an event or they coming, they're coming to HQ and we make some products together, that's what brings me joy. That's what fills my heart. Yeah. I, I, again, I mean, we're completely aligned. The second principle of our Scale X 10 principle framework is purpose and vision. Now, yeah. you've alluded to your why. You have you know, coined this as for yourself, your infinite purpose. Can you share with the listeners what... In, you know, why infinite purpose and what yours actually is yeah. uh, and and I want to dive into that a little bit more in terms of how you use that to actually create a community of 20,000 ambassadors and how important it is yeah yeah and and before I go into the infinite purpose you know every single listener to this podcast has the ability to change the world like if you are an entrepreneur you are already thinking bigger outside of the box. You're not working for someone else in a corporate environment. You are thinking of your own accord. And if you have that ability to think outside of the box, you can creatively think of ways to make the world a better place. And actually when you work for a purpose that is greater than yourself, that makes a positive impact on the world, you actually draw in more customers and more just more people anyway, just as a byproduct, which helps your business anyway, you know? Yeah, a lot a lot listening will be saying, and I I mean, I coach through our program on a one-to-one -one basis, quite a number of CEOs of SMEs, and the, the kickback I get is, yeah, that's all grand, and you can talk about Patagonia or Tropic Skin Care, and it's really important that people know your origin story, because nobody handed you this business, nobody gave you this infinite purpose. You had to, you had to, you know, make this and and take the action the next minimum viable action which was you know f spending a week creating the body scrubs putting them in jam jars and taking that action uh to to brave this new city this 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 new country and and get out there and and actually take action to do it and from that you know from those small jam jars filled with your handmade body scrub with the dodgy Microsoft labels. I mean, you're now changing an industry. What would you say to those who will kick back and say, well, it, yeah, this, this whole kind of concept of purpose is all a bit Pollyannish. You know, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to pay the bills at the moment. How important has it been for you, uh, Susie, in terms of creating this, this what yeah. is now a global brand? It's, it's fundamentally important for your brand to have a purpose beyond making money. Yeah. Really succeed. 
when we first started, my purpose was obviously the end goal was to help my mum purchase this house. But I truly believe that natural skincare products were just better for my customer's skin, for their, for their health, um, and also for the environment. And that was that was my key thing to, to give clean, make clean, healthy, natural skincare accessible to people and to give them a really beautiful sustainable experience because I think that skincare can do so much more than just make your skin good. But then later on, that purpose evolved. Like I wanted to do more and have a bigger impact on the world. You know, if you have the capability or the ability to make the world a better place, why wouldn't you? If you've got the resources, why wouldn't you? It just makes life so much more beautiful and fulfilling. So our infinite purpose today is to help create a healthier, greener, and more empowered world. And we do what we can in every element of the business to run towards that infinite purpose. Now, everyone's infinite purpose could be different. Sometimes, you know, I, if, if you have, let's say you have a mattress company, um, your purpose might be to help people, to improve people's lives by giving them the best night's sleep. If you're in a, I don't know, a supplements business, it could be that you want to help improve people's health. If, if you're selling clothing, maybe it's, it, maybe it's about giving people more confidence. Um, and it's really to kind of say that in a really clear sentence that you can communicate with the rest of your team and with your consumers so that they know that you care about them. They know that you really their, their well-being really matters to you or the planet's well-being really matters to you. That's when people will get behind you. If your mission in your business is simply because you found a niche in the market, you saw a gap and you took the opportunity to make some cash and maybe it'll work in the short term, but long term, that business is not going to last and not going to thrive if you don't communicate a purpose. So, you know, we're talking about scale up here. We're talking about building a long-term business that's going to continue to grow over time. Maybe sometimes there'll be dips, maybe sometimes there'll be ups, but overall there'll be growth. And in order to have a proper scale up business that's going to grow to nine figures or more, you have to have a meaningful purpose that people understand and, and, and get behind. How will people know when they've hit on their, their purpose? I suppose it's a feeling. And it's when you build a community. So I look at loyalty as part of our business. And I look at the customers who come back to us. I look at our ambassadors within our family. I look at our staff who stay with us. And you know, you ask them, why do you buy our product? You know, like, what, what, what is it? If they just say, because it's a good product, that's not enough. But if they say, because it makes me feel da 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 da, then you know you've achieved your purpose. Your purpose is connected to your why, which is always connected to a feeling. And some of the most like infamous brands across the world communicate a feeling. It's like, I don't know, if you, if you, if you look at any brand like Nike, one of the most, everyone knows Nike, they're not a sportswear brand. They're like a confidence brand, just do it, you know? It's like, how do you, you feel different when you put on a pair of Nike shoes versus like any other pair of shoes. It's why people go for like designer brands because it makes them feel, I don't know, expensive or feel more important. How does your product make your customer feel? And, and ask them those questions. Like look at the loyalty, look at people coming back to you because people come back to you time and time again, not just for your awesome product or service, but they come back to you time and time again because of the way you make them feel. And sometimes it's how you communicate something when they receive a product, sometimes it's an email, Sometimes it's, I don't know, like there, there are so, sometimes it's an event that you've organized, but the more you communicate your purpose to people, it gets in their brains and that's when they are ultimately extremely loyal to your business. And you can't scale without loyalty, but yeah. if you're gaining customers and then they're going to the competitors, you're just staying flat, right? You're always trying to get more customers. But scale up means loyal customers who repeat purchase with you who stay with you because you make them feel something that other brands yeah, don't. Yeah, so, so true. Again, we're, we're very aligned on that. The ninth principle of our ScaleX framework is partnerships. And we advocate, you know, leveraging those who's for the how, especially entering new markets. I mean, you've done that expertly, 20,000 ambassadors you've, you've spoken about. Beyond the communication of the, the purpose, what is 
what else is really important for those entering new markets, uh, either new sectors or new new geographic regions, in terms of actually cultivating those those loyal partners who are going to advocate for for your brand within their region or sector? Yeah, I think you know the most important thing for me in business, you know, when you're especially with entrepreneurs and business leaders, you guys are working hard day and yeah, day. Yeah. But the most important thing to remember is to enjoy yourself. And when you are happy and actually having a bit of a laugh and laughing at yourself when you make mistakes and surround yourself with a team that is like you in terms of, you know, they don't get too stressed. Now, I hate the word overwhelmed when people are all talking about anxiety and stress. I'm like, no, we're just whelmed. In business, there are, there are always loads of things. But if something can't happen, it doesn't matter. Like, we'll park it for another day. Like, make sure that you are enjoying the journey because that's what building a business is. There is no destination as such. It's just a journey that you're all on together. You have no idea where you're going, but you're on a journey towards a path that you all truly believe in. So just make sure you enjoy it. And if you enjoy what you do, if you really enjoy the products and you're not stressed every day on the bottom line, scratching your head what you're gonna do and you're worried about X, Y, Z, if you're really enjoying the parts of your brains light up for creativity and and that's really attractive to customers because they'll see that in your products that's really attractive to your wider team because they'll be inspired by you by your positive energy and i know sometimes it's easier said than done you know just yeah. be happy, enjoy your life it's <laughs> that, day, right? well, that, that's that's the next question how do you balance how do you balance you know ensuring that you enjoy this incredible journey that that you're on with the you know the infinite purpose of impacting the world so carrying kind of that on your shoulders on a on a daily basis but ensuring that actually you don't become overwhelmed that yeah. uh, that you ensure that you stay in that uh, wonderful state of creativity positivity you know joy in the the actual work itself How, what do you do susie to ensure that mm. you, you, you turn up the best that the best you can possibly be every day that's a great question so a few things i do the, the the first thing actually is to realize and this is really important this is something that i learned quite early on meeting quite a few incredibly successful entrepreneurs and it's a comforting knowledge that actually no one has a clue like there, there, there are moments in, in business when you're like i don't know what to do oh my god i'm doing this wrong everyone else is so much better than i am Actually, in business, I've met some of the most successful entrepreneurs. They're winging it their whole life. You know, they they just blowing by their gut. So, so having that knowledge, like no, like truly knowing that when you are struggling, when you are unsure of what to do, and when you are stressed and worried, know that every single other entrepreneur has gone through that. Think of every huge entrepreneur, every huge business leader. They they weren't given a manual on how to build. Microsoft or Virgin or anything like that. They they just winged it the whole time. They made mistakes just like everyone else. They didn't talk about the mistakes. And they just they just carried on. So that's that's the first thing that I make sure I remember that even when there are moments of self-doubt and etc., everyone else has gone through that. Yeah. The second thing, and this sounds really um a little bit corny perhaps, but I just I try to smile as much as I can. Yeah. And I <laughs> that's I, clear. I, yeah, and you know, it's it makes a difference when you speak to someone on the phone and when you're hearing a voice. If you're smiling, you can hear that someone is smiling. Or if I'm not smiling and my lips are down, you can hear the tone of voice is totally different. But actually, when you are smiling, you feel happier in yourself. So I try to remind myself to just, and I'm, I don't mean like a, a normal smile. I mean like a grin. You know, you're showing teeth. Smile through everything, even when things, even when you get told the worst news, I just like laugh at it. Like, oh my God, I can't believe that has happened. Because actually every time you laugh, every time you smile, you actually trigger off like happy endorphins and various happy chemicals that goes off because your body's like, she's smiling, she's laughing, she's happy. Let's send off more happy signals to the whole body. So I trick myself <laughs> into being happy and positive through just smiling as much as I can throughout the day. And actually, apparently, this is if you know if there's a better reason to smile. Smiling actually triggers like all the muscle groups in your cheeks to work. So you're giving your cheeks like a lift, like a push up. 
So this is like a workout for you. <laughs> every time you laugh and every time you smile. Um, and the third and final thing is just to make sure that you surround yourself with, with people who are positive, with a can-do attitude. Um, and, you know, I really, I really love working with people that talk a lot about the future of what's next. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I read a really interesting um, paragraph uh, last night, actually, about, you know, when people talk about growing old and growing young and, you know, how do you know when you're old? How do you know when you're young? And it's all in the mind. And if someone is talking about their past a lot and what they did in the past, that person is old mm-hmm. and maybe a little bit negative. If someone is talking about the future and what they are going to do next week or next month or next year, that person is young and that person is more positive. So I talk about in in my interviews when I'm recruiting people, I ask them about their lives and I try to, I get them to share stories with me and what they want to do. And if they talk more about their past and what they've achieved as opposed to what they want to do in the future and what difference they think they can make, then I'm like, "Mm, you've got like an old mentality and you're not my person. If they talk about, I've done all this, but I want to do this, and I feel like I can change this, and I'm like, you're, you've got a young mentality, yeah. and, and you're my kind of people. Yeah. So that's the third thing. Surround yourself with young-minded, doesn't have to be physically young, but young-minded, positive people, and you, you'll lift each other up. Here, here, sage advice and, and another compelling reason for actually crafting a vision for the future. Very, very few, actually, leaders of SMEs can articulate and clarify to others what that vision of the future is. So, you know, I hadn't heard that linkage before, but it makes complete sense, you know, now that, you know, talking about your past, reflecting on your past a lot is associated with an old mind, thinking yeah. about the future and what you can create is actually associated with a, with a young mind. I, I, that's the that's a that's a podcast, a Scalex Insider first. So love that. Um, can you share with the listeners, Susie, the the scale of the business now? And then what I'd like to touch on is some some inflection points from uh, you know from startup to to scale up. But give give the listeners a sense of the the scale of the business. So we scaled very quickly from the early days. Um, we, we actually doubled every single year for like the first six years. And we, we, we were featured in the, the Fast Track 100, the, top, the list of top 100 fast growing companies in the UK for like six years in a row. But I don't know if that was um, sustainable in a way. And, and actually the real growth happened during the pandemic. So over COVID when everyone was furloughed and lots of women were, were working at home and didn't have to take their kids to school, we had a huge influx of ambassadors who joined the business to earn some extra cash, but also our customers suddenly bought way more skincare than they ever did because they were at home. And what do you do when you're at home? You, know, you can't go outside. So you have Cover yourself in body bath. butter. Have, have yourself in body butter, have a bath, have an extra long shower, marinate your hair and hair, you know, our hair conditioners. So our skincare sales went through the roof. And so we actually scaled extremely quickly during COVID. We reached, um, so our so sales wise about 140 million um, in one year. That was back in 2021. That was the absolute peak of our business, um, and that was that was insane because it meant that we so we grew by 150 percent from the previous year, and that growth meant that you know we had to double our workforce within months. We had to get in way more ingredients from all over the world. We had to because we make everything. So every single area of the business had to be scaled from our lab to our production, to our pig pack dispatch, to our marketing team, to our customer service. And it was hectic. It was absolutely crazy. But the naivety on my part was to think that that growth was going to be sustained. In my mind, once you hit a certain level of sales, that's it. Like your business isn't going to go lower than that. It's going to continue to grow. And what I didn't anticipate was when lockdown ended, like literally on the dot when lockdown ended in June, 2022, the sales just suddenly dropped. People were allowed to go outside. They were allowed to go on holiday. They were allowed to go to the bars and pubs and restaurants. And so they weren't at home using skincare products. They weren't thinking about skincare. They were thinking about going out. And the ambassadors that we had that joined during COVID, 
that grew the business like crazy, they all went back to work. You know, it was just a temporary hustle for them. And that was a real shock to us, you know, the, the, the drop in sales. And with the current state of the economy and the changes, we're back down now to about 100 million. So quite, quite a drastic drop. And we've had to rethink what we do. So in the past, it was very frivolous in the way we were spending. I was like, yeah, guys, let's go on holiday. Let's spend, let's buy extra stuff. It's all cool. Let's pay for software. We'll go for the most expensive bracket because we've got the money. And now it's revisiting all of that and rethinking what do we really need? You know, having that scrappy mentality. Yeah. Because ultimately what we saw was our profit percentage suddenly drop, our yeah. percentage of profit to turnover suddenly take a squeeze. And, and I just looked at all the various costs within the business. And I think, gosh, pre-pandemic, we were making similar turnovers and we had half the people, we had half the software, we had half the inventory. And now our sales are so are much lower, but our costs are skyrocketing. So it's, it's making sure that you keep your finger on the pulse and yeah, and, and remembering that sometimes when you grow and you scale, it feels great in that moment, Yeah, but just be wary. <laughs> yeah. I'm smiling because I can relate to that whenever we enjoyed in, in, in my previous role as CEO of a, of an engineering business that scaled globally in the years where we enjoyed significant success. It's, it is interesting what happens to your psychology and how you know i was surrounded by lots of clever people we can justify anything you yeah. know we can justify cutbacks we can justify spending we can justify anything we to but something happens to your psychology in those in those times of abundance that moves away i love that uh, that that same scrappy mentality you know it's the, the 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 trick in all of this is maintaining a culture where the scrappy mentality is baked into the culture, regardless of your size. But I'm, I'm, I'm really keen to understand what have been some of the, some of the challenges, the real challenges of, of scaling And really you've scaled on steroids over the pandemic. So a lot of those challenges, I would say a lot of the, let's say some of the frailties of the, the business, uh, the little fissures within the business were, were fully exposed during that time, whenever the, the entire infrastructure was put under pressure. But what would you call out as some of the most significant challenges in your scaling journey, Susie? You know, as, as a leader and everyone listening to this will be able to relate to this is that you're always fighting fires, right? And there are challenges that come up that you would never in a million years anticipate the Suez Canal. We had all of our stuff stuck in the Suez Canal. I'm like, what is, I'll go over to this canal. And I will. <laughs> Where is this canal? I'll be on a flight. And, you know, like there, there are so many challenges, whether it's exchange rates going up and down and so many things will happen. But I suppose the biggest challenge for me as a leader throughout the whole process is being distracted on what I do best. It's so easy as a leader to jump into a customer service call and, and just, just wanting to get this right because, you know, you you want to make sure that it's done right. Or to jump into a specific, sometimes I get really, like, deep into, like, just even words on a, on a packaging. Um, and then I get distracted on the bigger picture. As a CEO, the only person that can drive the business forward is, is me, ultimately, because I'm steering the ship. And if I'm the captain steering the ship, but I leave the wheel to go and deal with fires over there and fires over there, then the ship is going to crash into somewhere else. And that's what happened during COVID, you know, and also throughout my journey, and I have to keep on bringing myself back, is that things will happen in the business and you will feel like you need to jump in and get involved and lead and, and solve the problem. But actually it's remembering if I spend my time doing that, am I going to be spending enough time doing what's most important? Yeah. And, and that's been a huge challenge for me. Uh, there's so much in that. This was a question actually that came up uh certainly a challenge came up and it was posed to me a number of months ago in the in the program using the ship analogy you know, we're based quite close to belfast here the titanic is always used in lots of different analogies <laughs> but it's, uh, so you know the the challenge for lots of leaders is knowing feeling compelled to be down shoveling coal to keep the engines moving 
but they must understand if they're down there helping others to shovel the coal, well then, who's actually up in the lookout tower, the highest point in the ship, to actually notify the rest of the company that there's an iceberg? So the, there is a balance to be had here between showing your team that you're willing to do anything yeah. that you're asking of them, but ensuring that actually you have taken the highest point on the ship so that actually you can continue to see the future and the obstacles in the way and inform you know the direction of the company whilst you're still keeping sight on the new, the new land the new horizon you want to get to the the how do you how do you discern susie when you're waking up in any given day what's the most important thing now what informs that what informs your 24 hours? Because we've all 24 hours in a day. Uh, yeah. So we've all had good days and bad days, right? I've had days where I've been totally unproductive, but procrastinated all day, didn't get anything. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs have that, you know, they're, they're, they're like, they have moments of genius and moments of just complete, like mind blank. Um, but I try before I go to bed every night to write down all of my thoughts of what I want to achieve the following day. And I have three key things that I write down that I'm like, okay, tomorrow I'll, I, I want to do this. And in the morning, I'll reflect on what I wrote the night before and I might tweak it. I might, there's, you know, your, your brain when you go to sleep is extremely powerful. There is an exercise that you can do where if you have a burning question, whether it's a problem you're trying to solve or a decision you can't make, you write down that question before you go to bed and your subconscious will figure it out. So by writing what you want to do or achieve the next day before you go to sleep, your brain will start to come up with the solutions as you're sleeping and your subconscious brain is amazing. And when you wake up in the morning, I then look through that. I, maybe I'll add some, I'll, I'll change things. And then at the end of the day, I'll reflect back and think, okay, have I done these? Did it work? And then I write for the next day. So that's a discipline that I have for myself of, of trying to keep myself on track and trying to keep myself focused on the bigger picture. And what will those tasks typically be? So, you know, from anything from, well, you know, the next day, you know, you're running this nine figure revenue business, but the dog needs groomed, you know, does that feature in your to do list or are you oh, always, no. <laughs> are you always keeping these, these three priorities aligned to, to what's really going to move the needle in terms of your, your, your progression towards your bigger vision? Yeah, always things that are going to move the needle. Like, there are things in my life that I just don't do. Because I think unless you enjoy doing them, or they yeah. go towards your why, don't do them. You've got to think about your hourly worth. You know, how much are you worth per hour? Yeah. Yeah. I look at, you know, my, my friends who, like, who are still kind of cleaning their houses and things like that. I'm like, you can get a cleaner for that. For 15 pounds an hour, you can yeah. get a really great cleaner. Is your time worth more than 15 pounds? So I don't, I have a cleaner who, who comes and does everything for me, folds my clothes, does all of that. The, you know, I actually enjoy grooming my dogs. So I, I cut her hair myself. Um, but, you know, unless you really enjoy doing something, if it's like a chore, that's not going to move the needle and help you towards your infinite purpose. Get someone else to do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Again, sage advice. I'm a big fan of Naval Ravikant, and he uh, he proposes something similar in terms of giving yourself a nominal hourly rate. And understand, if you're leading the the scaling business, your nominal hourly rate is going to be significant. And anything that you can delegate or hire someone else in to do that task for less than your nominal hourly rate, then then do that because ultimately, it's not uh, the most productive use of your time. So. Speaking of time, the time has absolutely flown here. Uh, you, you referenced entre all entrepreneurs are winging it uh, earlier on. You have worked on certainly a, a very successful entrepreneur who's become a, a billionaire, he is actually a member and an investor, uh, a member of your board and investor in your company, uh, Lord Sugar, who people will be very familiar with. You catapulted the fame through the show in which Lord Sugar takes a leading role, The Apprentice. What's, what have been the key learnings, if you could kind of share with the listeners three learnings from Lord Sugar, what would you say they are? So interestingly, Brendan, I actually bought Lord Sugar out last month. Oh, well done you. Congratulations. So I'm now the 100% owner of my company. <laughs> so he's no longer my business partner. 
Um, but in terms of what I've learned from him, you know, Lordship is a very, he's a very, um, he's a very hard man. You know, when he first invested, he invested 200,000 pounds into my business for a 50% share. Mm -hmm. And he always said from the get-go that that was it, that there was no further money, that if you guys were struggling, he would just, and, and, and he maintains that, by the way, for mm -hmm. all of his investments, that if there were any struggles, he's out, like he's not going mm -hmm. to invest more money into your company. And I remember thinking that that was quite harsh in the mm -hmm. beginning, but actually that tough, that toughness gets you to not have something to rely on. It's it's like, it's like my, you know, I, I see a stark contrast between the friends who know that they're having a huge inheritance coming to them versus the friends who know that they won't have anything coming yeah. to them in the past. There is a totally different drive. Mm -hmm. So I suppose the one thing that he's taught me is, is, is to not have that safety net. And if you don't have that safety net, you will work harder and you not even work harder, but you will, you'll be smarter in the decisions that you make mm. and ensure that your company lasts and not make frivolous decisions because there was nothing to fall back on. So, so that harshness is something that I might, you know, I might, I might take on to my children in the future. You know, there's nothing coming to you. <laughs> <laughs> giving you this much money and that's it. Once you spend it, it's gone. Then come crying to me when you're stuck. <laughs> um, I like that toughness. Yeah, it sounds um, like you've heard overheard conversations in our house, by the way. <laughs> you know, that, it's, it's, it's good at, at driving, um, at driving and motivating people for sure. Yeah. Um, the other thing I've learned from Lord Sugar is, is also, you know, similar to what I've always believed in. And the most important thing for every business is to make sure the bottom line works. There are so many companies that I speak to that say, and I, and I, you know, sometimes it makes sense where they say, okay, the first few years, I'm not looking to make profit. I'm just looking to scale. I'm just looking to um, invest. But it's like, why not? Why wouldn't you try and make some profit? Why can't you start a little bit smaller, be more scrappy, test out the market and grow organically and make profit at every stage? You know, right from the get-go, even before Lord Sugar invested, because I had the business for a long time before he did, We've been profitable since day one. Yeah, I've never on. had a year where we've not made profit because yeah. why would you run a business? What like you're just then paying for everyone yeah. else's wages, paying all your suppliers. What's left for you and the company? How's the company going to grow? So I do believe that to really have proper scale up, you have to focus on profits and not just forgo that. Maybe it's different in companies like tech. I'm talking about products specifically. Um, but that's just that's just my own personal belief and, and having that bottom line in the green zone every year is what I suppose is what helps me sleep at night. Yeah, I, I completely agree. By the way, the, the sixth principle is performance. And I you know, we have both backgrounds in finance actually, and you know, I believe that fundamentally, you know, again the, the, the it's cliche, but sales is vanity, profit sanity, and cash is reality, you know, and and when I speak to SME leaders and we talk about purpose as the take making a profit as just a given, you know, you're in business, it's incumbent on you to, to lead a business responsibly. And part of leading a business responsibly is to ensure that it's profitable, to ensure that there's cash in the bank, to ensure that you have sufficient cash headroom. You know, those are all fundamentals that should be taken as a given The And yes, I, I struggle on the tax side when, uh, when, companies, leaders in the startup tech arena talk about kind of series A and series B and series C and, and, you know, we're not going to be profitable until kind of year five. And it kind of, I, I, it, that doesn't, that I struggle with that because I, like you, Susie, I believe you should be profitable from the outside or certainly be focused on, I interviewed a wonderful guy, Mike McCallowich in one of the earlier seasons and he has a book called profit first <laughs> you know it's to target that and ensure that treat profit almost like uh you have to cover an expense and yeah. ensure that you're paying yourself before you arrive at that profit as well so so we're absolutely aligned i'll push you on a third uh lesson from from lord sugar oh the third lesson from lord sugar what else did i learn from him we didn't actually spend a huge amount of time i suppose I suppose it is the cash element, 
Um, actually, no, the other thing, the, the third and final thing I learned from Lord Sugar is actually take money off the table. Right. Um, and, and at the end of every year, take some money off the table for yourself and, and to look after your own personal finances as well. You know, I've got friends who um, have just left all the money in the company every single year. And in the end, when, you know, the economy flopped or whatever happened, they lost, they ended up losing everything. Yeah. And that's not to say that you take the money off the table and spend it all on yourself. It's to park the money and save it for a rainy day. And, and maybe, I don't know, maybe it's his wisdom from all of his years of experience or his age or whatever, but he's, he's always recommended just saving some, not obviously not spending everything, but saving it and just parking it and maybe it will come in use. Yeah, great, great advice. Before we move into the close, Susie, what we see in our program is, you know, sadly, in terms of representation, there's typically 12 CEOs in a cohort and, you know, two of those will be females. What would you say to, to the female listeners out there or those who maybe you know, are thinking about starting a business or maybe stuck in their business, not sure about scaling, balancing priorities between home and work. And what would you, what would, what advice would you give them to encourage them to, to scale? Yeah. You know, as a woman, there is no better feeling than knowing that you are in control of your own maternity leave, your own maternity pay, and just your own flexibility for your family and your children. I don't have kids yet. I will want to have children one day in the future. And it's really comforting to know that if one day I can't be bothered to go to work because my baby needs me or I need, I want to spend extra time breastfeeding, I can do that. Yeah. And you are your own boss and you will be your worst critique because you're, you know, you're in charge of yourself and there will be a lot of hard work in the beginning, but ultimately long-term you're building a legacy for yourself and for your family that gives you complete flexibility. And on top of that, I did read a statistic and I can't remember the exact statistic, but I do know that women founders and women CEOs are statistically so much more successful than men. That's because women have all this feminine energy yeah. that, that makes more conscious decision that really focuses on the why. And, and also women are, dare I say it, you know, better at bringing people together and because and, they're yeah. more empathetic naturally. Yeah. 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 And and it's a real shame because actually like I think less than 1% of private equity investment goes into female-led businesses despite them being way more successful or, you know, and earning way more money. So it's having that confidence in yourself. And I think there is that real shift now in the world. You know, you have that traditional model of, the woman is the mother, she stays at home looking after the child, the father goes and works and makes the money. That's completely shifted. I know so many powerful women who are the breadwinners in their family and it feels amazing as I am my, in my family. So like, I would say go for it. Know that you have a right. success than our male counterparts and start small. You have a huge network of women entrepreneurs, loads of female groups. And actually that's, that's actually, I will mention, um, there's a, there's a lovely woman called Saha who founded the Coffee Republic. She's yeah, I heard her speak last week actually at the oh, SME Expo, Expo in London. Yeah, yeah. Great. Right. Well, she has a company called um, By Women Built. Yeah. Where women entrepreneurs supporting each other and giving each other knowledge and feedback, and and it's it's women supporting women. So if you if you want to start up your own business, if you look for it, there are so many support networks of how they, how people did it in a similar industry to yours. You can learn from their mistakes um, to help you scale, but, yeah. but, but, but do it. Here, <laughs> here, yeah. as the, yeah. the father of two teenage daughters, this is an oh. episode I'm going to be encouraging them to, to listen to on repeat. So brilliant advice. Before we move into the close, Susie, is there anything that you feel that we haven't touched on today that, uh, that you're compelled to, to share with our listeners who have ambition to scale with purpose? Yeah, and, you know, I think scaling with purpose is really important, a particular focus on the word purpose. You know, we need to make sure that we as entrepreneurs, that we're not always focused on just scaling and growth and more money and bigger, 
because as entrepreneurs, you know, you, we always want more, like yeah. nothing's ever good enough for us. <laughs> Our own bosses, we always want to do better and go bigger. But to really remember why you're doing it. And sometimes it might mean that you have a couple of years of negative growth or just flatness. What, it's fine. As long as you are enjoying the journey, that you are focused on the bottom line, that you're still making profit and that you are working towards your purpose, then the growth and the scale up doesn't really matter. Just, yeah, just, and I say this, especially for now when the economic climate is difficult and we're seeing it internally in our business where sales aren't where we would like originally hope that they would be at this stage because we were ambitious from the growth from the pandemic. You know, it's just to really look at the most important things in a company. So right now I'm looking at, right, guys, the sales aren't as, like, growing as what we wanted it to be, but what's most important right here? Our most important thing is obviously the product. Let's improve the product. Make sure it's the if we're going to spend money, don't worry about the marketing and all of that stuff right now. Let's really, really focus on upscaling our products, making sure that they are the best they can possibly be so that when people use our products, they're never going to go anywhere else. Yeah. Let's make sure the community that we build, the communication that we put out, everything is, is top notch because that's what's most important. And then the growth and the marketing and all of that stuff, it, it will come, it will flow. Yeah, you know, I, that resonates so strongly. I always find in challenging times I've been through, kind of led the company through the, uh, the global financial crisis, which gave us, the, we came out the other end saying it was the best recession that ever happened. It actually forced creativity within the product set, which actually then led the product to become the, 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 the standard for the way the industry actually delivered projects and our processes, which were failing prior to that. You know, it was always a case of we'll address that afterwards, but actually the, the recession forced us to actually build robust processes, which actually then created an infrastructure to allow us to allow us to scale once they once we had navigated through the global financial crisis. So uh, wise words indeed, Susie, I suspect there, there might be some overlap, but I always pose this question to our guests in closing. Can you share with the listeners, given the incredible experience that you've had in, in scaling your business to date and just an, an unbelievable backstory. I'm waiting for the, 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 the stage musical to the Susie Ma musical to appear in London. It's just an incredible, uh, backstory and, and, uh, really, I want to thank you today for, for sharing with me and with the listeners your backstory it's uh it's been a real privilege to to actually hear that yeah. firsthand can you share with our listeners three timeless takeaways three timeless takeaways profit focus on profit make sure that your business is healthy um, i love what you said about turnover vanity profit sanity and cash reality so that's that's number one takeaway number two is really find your why and your and it, like I say, it has to be linked to that feeling of, of just, and, and also think about at the end of your life, when you look back, what you've done in your business, what you've achieved, does it give you the feelings that you want? Really think about that one. And the third and final is just to have fun. Yeah. Enjoy. Your life is fleeting. And uh, there is so much in the world to be enjoyed. Like, you know, one of my, one of my passions is actually, um, learning about space and I, I, I love looking at, at the cosmos and, and what you realize is that we are so tiny, <laughs> like we are so insignificant in the fabric of time. And there are so many worries and things in life to be stressed about. Don't worry about it. Hakuna Matata. You know, <laughs> focus on the in life and just, just have fun and enjoy life. Your business should be fun. You should get out of bed every morning with excitement for the future, not worrying about the past. Live young, live happy, and, and have fun and smile. Because when you smile loads and laugh loads, yeah. it will naturally come to you. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Because I don't think I've smiled as much. Uh, my, my jaws sore through a podcast. So thank you for that. Oh. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been brilliant. I feel great, actually. I could speak to you for hours. You bring so much wonderful energy. So, you know, back to the, the feeling. You know, I, I, I feel good after this interaction. And that's really important for leaders to understand. It's about making people feel good. Where someone once said to me, we're not logical, we're biological. You know, we buy based on a feeling. So 
So I'm going to go out and get some Tropic Skin Care products after this. <laughs> Certainly the anti the anti mosquito uh, repellent ones. So I'm uh, looking forward to that. You mentioned excitement for the future, Susie. What's what's next for you? I almost envision you guys what Patagonia is to the clothing industry. I mean, you guys are to the skincare industry. So uh, without kind of putting that that burden on you, what what's next for you? So Tropic will be 20 years next year. Wow. Um, crazy is that we have never even stepped into international waters yeah. you know we've just been growing rapidly in the uk and international expansion is our next step brilliant so whether that's just moving into just i don't know something small internationally or just distributing internationally but you can't make you can't help to create a healthier grid or a more empowered world without selling your products yeah. locally. Yeah. So that would be the next step but not before really tightening up and elevating our existing products and working out a really robust upgraded training platform for our ambassadors because they're our priority right now yeah. to make sure that they are earning what they deserve to be earning with us um, and and just helping them on their on their entrepreneurial journey. Good on you. Awesome. Here, here. Awesome the oh, that's brilliant. And you speak to firmly to the eighth principle of our Scale X framework, which is place. I assert that you cannot scale a business if you if you don't have a, a vision for the business that takes the business beyond your existing borders. So so well done you. Uh, that what a what a wonderful journey ahead. Susie, I have no doubt that there'll be lots of people who want to find out more about Susie Mann, about Tropic Skin Care. Where best to to connect and reach you? On my Instagram, Susie Martropic is the Instagram handle. So you can follow me and send me a message there. Brilliant. Well, look, I have thoroughly enjoyed the last hour and a quarter. It's been a real privilege to host you on the show today. I wish you all the very best in what's going to be an incredibly bright future. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Brendan. Likewise, thank you for inspiring me and all your gorgeous listeners. And I hope to speak to you soon. Thank oh, brilliant. Take care. Thank you. Take care.